It is 1 a.m. in Washington, 8 in Kiev, and 2 on a Wednesday afternoon here in Seoul. I'm Moon Gonyoung. These are what's making headlines at this hour. Two weeks ago on this Wednesday, a ferry carrying hundreds of passengers sank off Korea's southwestern coast. Today, divers continue to battle strong currents and murky waters to search for the missing. Pyongyang is not prepared to carry out a fourth nuclear test, says a U.S. expert, although it seems that the reclusive state is weighing up the diplomatic and economic consequences. And Korea's industrial output marked a turnaround from 2013, expanding slightly in March compared to the month before on increased production by manufacturers. Two weeks have passed since the tragic Seoul of ferry disaster put this entire nation in a state of shock, sorrow and frustration. The number of confirmed dead has surpassed the 200 mark, but more than 90 people still remain unaccounted for. For a look at the latest developments on the search and rescue front as well as an ongoing investigation, our Kwon Suha joins us live from the News Center. Now, so uh, compared to the last few days, the weather seems to have uh, gotten much better. Uh, is it working in favor of the search and rescue efforts down at the accident site? Konyang, the answer to your question is yes and no. But first, let me give you a quick rundown on where we stand in terms of the death toll. The current death toll in the Seolho ferry accident stands at 210. Five bodies were retrieved at around 3 a.m. this Wednesday on the left side of the fourth floor of the ship and in the lobby on the fifth floor. Now, search operations continue today, but search divers are encountering problems. Although the weather conditions are favorable with clear skies, the tides are high and the currents fast. Even during one of the more calm hours this morning, divers failed to get into the ship. Now, around 20 minutes from now, the waters are expected to be at their calmest again and will stay that way for about two hours, so rescue crews will do what they can during the period to gain better access inside the ferry. They'll also get another chance at around 9 this evening. Well, let's hope that this uh, crucial time window brings some uh, positive news. Now, so can you give us de more details on how the operations are unfolding today? Sure. The Navy, Maritime Police and civilian divers will continue with the search today, focusing on the fourth floor where initially most of the missing were thought to be, but also on the fifth floor lobby where many of the recently retrieved bodies were located. The commander of the recovery operation thinks the bodies found in the lobby were of students who had been on the fourth floor. As the water started coming in, the students probably instinctively rushed to the upper floor. The students most likely tried to make their way up the stairs to the fifth floor to get onto the deck of the ship, but unfortunately they were not able to get out. Now, meanwhile, a diving bell, which would allow divers to stay underwater for longer periods of time, could not be deployed earlier in the day due to the rough water conditions, but another try will be made this afternoon. All right, let's move on to the uh, criminal investigation. What's the latest on the criminal negligence charges being brought against several people associated with this accident? Well, the special investigation team is speeding up its probes, especially regarding the practical owner of the ferry operator, Yu byung -un. Now, one of seven key figures linked to Yu, the CEO of the cosmetics company Ta Panda, named Song Guk Bin, was questioned at the Incheon District Prosecutor's Office this morning on suspicion of corruption. As for the Yu family, prosecutors are looking into first summoning the members currently in the country, which includes Yu's children. Meanwhile, the latest this investigation reveals that the Seolho ferry had been put on sale a month before the accident. It was being sold for an amount that would have resulted in financial losses of roughly $5.8 million. Investigators are trying to figure out why. Now that's all I have for now, but I'll be back with more updates in a further newscast. 
Now, the Seoul affair tragedy and the government response has public officials, including the president, taking a long look in the mirror. To make sure the nation is prepared for the event of future crises, President Park Geun-hye has ordered the establishment of a control tower whose sole purpose would be to manage and coordinate disaster responses. Arirang News' Ji Myung-gil has more. Public distrust of the government has grown considerably over the past couple of weeks over its handling of the Seoul ferry disaster. To more effectively deal with future crises, President Park Geun-hye announced yesterday that a new ministry will be launched under the purview of the Prime Minister's office. This new body will serve as a control tower in the event of an emergency. The president said the new body would handle any number of disasters and accidents, ranging from chemical leaks and oil spills to issues with telecommunication networks or power supplies. The envisioned ministry will consist of experts, including foreigners who specialize in crisis management and disaster response. And they'll be given the authority to train and deploy special forces in emergency situations. President Park's proposal will be included in a revised bill on restructuring the government, which is to be discussed at the National Assembly. In February, the president instructed the Ministry of Security and Public Administration to establish up a nationwide system to manage disasters and emergencies, but it failed to come up with an effective one. President Park has lashed out at government officials in recent days, who she said are responsible for failing to properly manage the Seoul ferry disaster, the nation's worst maritime tragedy in decades. Kim Myung-gil, Arirang News. Meanwhile, over in the United States, the nature is taking a toll. A number of tornado warnings have expired as the U.S. folds into Tuesday night, though some storm risks still remain in the south and the east coast. The hardest hit states of Mississippi and Alabama remain in the projected path of the weather system that spawned tornadoes. At least 35 people have been killed in the severe storms that stretched across six states and that have persisted since Sunday local time. Tens of thousands were left without power Tuesday with the worst of the out outages reported in parts of Alabama and Georgia. A day after North Korea fired off 50 heavy artillery shells just north of its maritime border with South Korea, the United States has spoken out, calling on Pyongyang to stop its string of provocation. Now, the next one could come in the form of a nuclear test, and some experts say that even though a fourth nuclear test is highly likely, it is not imminent. Our Kim Hyun bin tells us why. The press secretary of the Pentagon, John Kirby, called on North Korea on Tuesday to stop his provocations that are stirring up tensions on the Korean peninsula. Kirby's comments came in response to North Korea's live fire drill near the de facto marine time border with South Korea and the West Sea on Tuesday, during which 50 heavy artillery shells were fired. It was the latest in a string of provocative acts from north of the border. The larger question, though, is what's next? The speculation is that the North will conduct a fourth nuclear test in the near future, but determining when is another story. Despite thorough analysis of several commercial satellite images, Joel Witt, a senior fellow with the U.S. Korea Institute at Johns Hopkins University, said it's hard to predict. While Witt said that there are currently no signs that a test is imminent, he added that North Korea is almost certain to carry out a nuclear test at some point. While we wait, the North Korean regime continues to talk up its nuclear program. The regime on Tuesday condemned U.S. President Barack Obama's visit to Northeast Asia and said it would strengthen its nuclear deterrent. The North's National Defense Commission said it has the capacity to carry out something bigger than a boost-efficient nuclear weapon test or a new intercontinental ballistic missile launch, and that the regime would not dismantle the program under any circumstances. Kim Hyun bin Arirang News. Meanwhile, a North Korea expert in China has also put forth his forecast on Pyongyang's fourth nuclear test. Yang Shiwi, a research fellow from the China Institute of International Studies, says North Korea will conduct a fourth nuclear test sooner or later. 
He said resuming the stall six party talks in Pyongyang's denuclearization and giving aid to the country is the only way to prevent North Korea from following through on its threat. The Beijing based expert also added that he expects North Korea to conduct even more nuclear tests in the future as the regime has no intention of giving up its nuclear program. South Korea's defense ministry has said North Korea is prepping for a fourth test, but it's still not clear if. Pyongyang is just faking the buildup to one. Plans to establish a memorial paying tribute to the victims of Japan's wartime sexual enslavement are reaching an advanced stage over in Washington. An official speaking on behalf of a group of Korean American societies in the U.S. says preparations began two years ago and funds have been raised to buy the rock that will be used for the statue. They added that the monument could be set up as early as next month. Now, when the statue is established, surviving comfort women officials from the Korean Council for Women Drafted for Military Sexual Slavery and Korean citizens living in that district are expected to commemorate the establishment. The first memorial statue in the U.S. was established in New Jersey in 2010. Now, over in Ukraine, the movements by pro-Russian forces on the ground show no sign of slowing down as they have taken over yet another key government post. The latest seizure happened in Luhansk, one of the largest cities in eastern Ukraine and, geographically speaking, just 32 kilometers from the Russian border. A provincial government headquarters there was stormed by thousands of activists with iron rods on Tuesday and regional police reportedly did nothing to stop them. And then later at night, gunmen armed with automatic weapons and stun grenades forced themselves into the headquarters of the, regi of the region's police. Now, this as a self-declared Donetsk People's Republic has vowed to stage a referendum vote next month before the state's presidential elections. Interim President Alexander Turchinov criticized the local police for their inaction and quote, criminal treachery. This as Interior Minister Arsen Avakov told the BBC that presidential elections may not be able to take place in all regions of the country due to the unrest. All of the day's important events, events close to home and around the world. Join Moon Gon Yong, live from Seoul. Ball shopping market for the dual use of the Korean name East and the Japanese name Sea of Japan in school textbooks. The Korean government is putting its foot down over massive debt and excessive benefits of public organizations. New reform measures order wide-scale changes with specific goals that must be reached. And if they are not, the CEOs of the organizations could find themselves out of a job. Song ji -sun has more. Public organizations in Korea have long been criticized for their ballooning debts and excessive employee benefits, and the government is determined to end such practices. They finalized a plan to sell off their non-core assets slash exorbitant benefits and streamline the overall business structure. As the first step to overhaul nearly 300 public institutions, the finance minister has ordered them to reduce their debt by some 50 billion U.S. dollars over the coming years. Their goal is to lower the combined debt level of these organizations to 187 percent by 2017, down 34 percentage points from 2012. The government will conduct an interim evaluation of their debt reduction efforts in the second half of this year. If the organization's progress is deemed unsatisfactory, their CEOs could be replaced and the salaries of their employees frozen. Welfare benefits for employees could also be axed. Welfare spending at the institutions will be slashed by an average of $700 per person a year, down a quarter from last year. The measures are part of a three-year economic innovation plan announced by President Park Geun-hye in February to normalize the public sector. Song ji -sun, Arirang News. And shifting gears to the economy, Korea's industrial output rebounded in March on the back of strong exports of automobiles and computer chips. Now, uh, concerns linger, however, on the impact that the sunken ferry disaster might have on the economy in the coming months. 
Our Hwang Ji-hae reports. Korea's industrial output last month dismissed worries that the nation's economy might not be recovering as many had hoped. Statistics Korea said Wednesday that the nation's industrial output rose 0.9 percent in March from the previous month following two straight months of decline. The agency attributed the gain in industrial output, which includes production in the mining, manufacturing and gas industries, to strong exports of automobiles and semiconductors. It added that most sectors, including retail sales and facilities investment, performed better than the previous month. The Bank of Korea data also showed that business sentiment among Korean manufacturers is on a moderate pace of recovery. The index, which gauges the assessment from manufacturers on current business conditions, came in at 82 this month, up from 81 in March. Although a reading below 100 still means that pessimists outnumber optimists, the reading for April marked the third straight month of strengthening business confidence. While concerns remain over whether the improvement will continue in the coming months with the sunken Sewolho ferry disaster hurting consumer sentiment, Nomura Securities believes the disaster will have a limited impact on the economy. The Japanese financial group kept its growth forecast for Asia's fourth largest economy for this year unchanged at 4 percent. Hwang Jie, Arirang News. The world's two leading smartphone makers are reaching the end of another core battle. Samsung Electronics and Apple made their closing arguments to a jury in California Tuesday in a patent infringement case with billions of dollars at stake. Our Kim ji Yun tells us how it went. Apple Incorporated and Samsung Electronics have made their final arguments at a $2 billion trial over patent infringement in the U.S. state of California. The two sides were each given two hours to make their final cases on Tuesday. Apple's lawyer Harold McElhaney told the jury that Samsung had become the world's leading seller of smartphones by willfully and intentionally copying the iPhone maker's features. Samsung's lawyer Bill Price said that Samsung's success was based on providing the best hardware for Android and that the features under fire were already developed and included in Google's independently developed platform. Price said Apple wasn't even using three of the five patents it raised in the complaint. He said Samsung could not copy something from the iPhone if it wasn't featured in the iPhone at the time. Apple claims some Samsung devices, including the Galaxy S3, infringed on five of its patents, including on features like the slide to unlock function and automatic spell corrects. Samsung filed a counterclaim that some of the Apple's devices, including the iPhone 5, infringed upon two of its patents concerning Apple's video chatting service called FaceTime and the way in which Apple's devices retrieve and organize digital images. Apple is asking for nearly 2.2 billion U.S. dollars in damages from Samsung, who in turn has asked for more than 6.2 million dollars from Apple. Samsung was ordered to pay damages of $929 million to Apple in their first trial over dueling claims of patent infringement. Both companies appealed, and the decision has since moved up to a higher court. Kim ji Arirang News. Well, on to some welcome news. Korea's ancient mountain fortress, Naman Sansung Fortress, is likely to be added to the UNESCO World Heritage List in June. The Cultural Heritage Administration says UNESCO's advisory panel, the International Council on Monuments and Sites, recently evaluated the historic mountain wall and recommended it be given world heritage status. Well, with the recommendation, Naman Sansung Fortress is almost certain to be added to the UNESCO list at the 38th meeting of the World Heritage Committee in Doha, Qatar in mid-June. The Strategic Defense Fortress is more than 1,000 years old and is located southeast of Seoul. The Heritage Administration says the fortress was recommended for its historical representation of military architecture and city planning in ancient Asia.
Now, the recent two-day visit by U.S. President Barack Obama to Korea resulted in more than just talks with President Park Geun-hye on a wide range of issues, including security issues and the economy. Well, he also returned a few Korean national treasures. And, of course, our Im Yoon-hee joins me today for our arts and culture segment, and she will take a closer look at them for us. Good afternoon to you, Yoon-hee. Good afternoon, Kun Young. So that's right, uh, President Barack Obama brought back nine seals, and these date back to uh, the Joseon Dynasty as well as the Tan Empire. And so they were supposedly found in San Diego last year and returned, and he brought them with him um, on his recent visit. And so let's take a closer look. They were taken from Korea more than 60 years ago, picked up in a ditch near a ransacked Toksugung Palace. During the Korean War, many of Korea's cultural properties and artifacts were either lost or stolen.